around AR automation and pay payment cycle management. He has over five years of experience in the software as a service industry. Prior to Build Trust, Patrick worked for another provider, ICIMS, managing their inter international education programs. With a Bachelor of Arts degree in communications from Monmouth University, Patrick is dedicated to continuing the conversation surrounding advancements in the financial and invoice to cash space. So at this juncture, I'll turn it over to Patrick to begin the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. Um, now, just to begin, I'd like to just quickly present and talk about who Bill Trust is overall. Um, you know, we, we've created strategic cloud-based cloud solutions to help accelerate your cash flow. Um, by automating invoice delivery, invoice payments, and cash application. You know, we truly believe that, that customers should have flexibility and convenience, but also should the B2B suppliers themselves. Um, customers should be able to receive invoices and pay them instantly, anytime, anywhere, and really using any payment method that's most convenient to them. With that, AR departments need accurate, flexible solutions which send invoices and accept payments automatically in a touchless process. All right, so with that out of the way, uh, let's dive into really why we're all here today. Um, and to begin, really I want to touch on the old adage of the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, certainly it is true here, and it's certainly true as it pertains to the supplier-buyer payment relationship overall. Um, when we talk about the traditional channels, we can look back about 30 to 40 years. Um, and at this juncture, the invoice to cash process was pretty simple. Uh, really, it was all paper. A paper invoice went out, and a paper in, a paper check came back in the door. Um, you know, while this was very simple and easy to manage, um, it was very much manually intensive uh, and had a very long process cycle. Uh, just from that, moving forward to the 1980s, about 10 years, um, we have EDI or electronic data interchange come along and, and play into the fold. Um, so now electronic media is in the mix. Um, invoices and business information can now be transferred almost instantly, um, and it just begins to muddy the water a little bit. Uh, then things really started to blow up in the 1990s. Uh, the Internet exploded and became something of a disruptive force for finance teams. Uh, invoices could be emailed. Clients could utilize websites to gain access to account information and invoices on demand. Um, and businesses can now take payments online with credit cards and ACH. Uh, so technology allowed a faster way for customers to manage their accounts and manage their money. Um, however, on the other hand, multi-channel options created this layer of complexity and chaos for businesses trying to serve them. Um, and let's not all forget as well at this time, you know, we're still trying to service and support customers who prefer paying via paper check and paper invoice. Um, and as we all know, those intricacies and challenges still really exist today. Um, looking ahead, there's even more complexities that are gaining a significant foothold, and specifically this pertains to the virtual cards. Uh, anyone who has done any significant business internationally still shakes their head just at how much the U.S. relies on paper checks for payments, um, particularly within B2B transactions. The last figures I, I actually read reported that roughly 50% of B2B payments are still done with paper checks, um, and trend lines suggest that that figure really isn't at all likely to change here in the short term. Uh, Forbes actually reported that for businesses, there are clear reasons why electronic payments are growing in popularity. In addition to offering convenience, they can also lower processing costs and improve internal controls by automating the account reconciliation process and minimalizing human error. In addition, businesses that leverage technology to manage finances are finding it can help them boost income as they struggle with rising business costs and competitive labor markets. One of the newest and most flexible types of electronic payments is the virtual credit card. Virtual credit cards are a particularly interesting method of payment that's set to take off over the next several years. According to multiple financial experts, virtual credit cards, while still just in their infancy today, could eventually become ubiquitous among businesses. Um, now, just after covering that uh, quote there from Forbes, I just wanted to kind of level set uh, and, and ensure that we kind of define what virtual cards are. Uh, so a virtual credit card 
uh, is a 16-digit credit card number that's created for the express purpose, purpose of paying a single transaction at a predetermined amount, um, but without actually having a physical card. Um, the virtual credit card itself is a randomly generated number. Um, you can usually set a maximum charge amount for the virtual card um, and set the card to, the, to expire at a predetermined date. Uh, for the business you're paying, the virtual card looks the same as any other credit card. Um, and as we look at the trend lines here, you know, we can see that commercial credit card usage is looking to increase around 9.7% annually. Um, and virtual card usage is set to grow around 24% annually. And that's just an outstanding growth rate overall. So as we saw in the aggregate, commercial card usage is rapidly growing among AP departments. The fastest growing subset of commercial cards are the virtual cards, as I previously noted. Um, and these are one-time use cards and are typically generated by a customer's AP system or the bank and an email to the supplier. Um, there are a number of reasons as to why virtual card spend is expected to increase so much over the next few years. Um, and just to name a few, one, card brands and issuers are really proactively working to push usage of these cards and push spend on these cards overall. Um, two, AP departments really are beginning to benefit from that increased float time. Three, AP departments benefit from the rebates, miles, points, even sometimes cash back, um, similar to what we see with our own individual credit card usages. Uh, and four, perhaps the most important, um, is virtual cards fit into the automated invoice approval and payment workflow almost seamlessly. Uh, so we are certainly not the only ones noting this trend as well. Um, Tom Rogers, the CEO of Vendor Centric, was quoted as saying, virtual credit cards generate cash rebates for the companies that use them, while also adding an enhanced level of security and fraud protection to the accounts payable process. So when I first started exploring the AR world, um, I never realized just how many different types of cards there are. Um, you know, there are TE cards for, for sales teams, uh, fleet cards to ensure that drivers are only using it for fuel and not those eBay bids, um, and, and multiple, multiple other cards out there. Um, again, to ensure that we are all informed here, I just wanted to briefly go through the descriptions uh, of what you might actually encounter. Uh, so the first one is a purchasing card, also abbreviated as a P card. Um, and that is a form of company charge card that allows goods and services to be purchased uh, without using a traditional purchasing process. Uh, these are generally used by trusted buyers, uh, but these purchases usually go routine scrutiny no less frequently than once per month. Uh, a second type is a ghost card, um, and these are a type of virtual card. Corporations, government agencies, and other large employers use ghost cards as an alternative to issuing credit cards to each employee. Um, each employee uses the ghost card number and then the organization pays for the charges using a single account. This brings us to the single use virtual credit cards. Um, buyer initiated cards uh, are these transactions where the funds are actually pushed to you. Um, there's no need to, to key in the card number or the remittance information because your client has already gone ahead and done that for you. Uh, a great example of such transaction is using an online payment portal. Uh, suppliers have been incredibly slow to adopt online payments in B2B space for a number of reasons. Uh, however, lagging behind can actually be a devastating strategy overall to an organization. In essence, you are actually making it harder for organizations to give you money. Uh, allowing your clients to, to interact with you in a way they desire is an absolute best practice, um, especially when it results in you actually getting paid. The Hacker Group estimates that organizations that use an automated invoice to cash process see an increase of 26% in their cash flow. Now imagine what you could do with that type of increase against your toughest competitor. Um, now, just to touch on, let's talk about the final point, the supplier-initiated payments. Um, this is in direct contrast to, to buyer-initiated payments. Uh, the supplier-initiated payments are the, the card payments that are sent by uh, email, phone, fax, um, and the supplier's AR team needs to actually manually key in the information to make the payment. Since the, since the supplier has to run the entire process themselves, um, they really need to ask some difficult, some difficult questions, you know, and reflect on those questions overall. Um, you know, what are the risks that I'm accruing? 
Uh, how much time does it take to deal with this? Um, and how large do I need to grow to be able to compensate um, while also, you know, am I losing cash flow because of these overall delays? Looking at the chart here as well, you know, we can see a, a staggering number in terms of virtual cards are actually estimated to be about $315 billion in spend by the year 2021. Um, and that's really a number that just can't be ignored. Uh, the growth rate of all virtual cards is actually anticipated to grow, like I mentioned before, by 24% versus plastic card growth that's only around 7.1%. Uh, to that point, you can see from the projections by the uh, Mercer Advisory Group, um, single-use virtual payments are set to overtake the more traditional methods of traditional plastic card usage and ghost card usage uh, in about three years' time. You really need to be prepared for this uh, and have a strategy around virtual cards themselves. Uh, your customers are already moving to these methods at a, a greater rate than other payment methods. Um, and if you don't have a strategy in place, your team is going to be unquestionably overwhelmed by the amount of work that goes into facilitating and really accepting these payments. So while it's fairly clear that organizations need to be ready for the increase in virtual card usage, what are some of the barriers that they're beginning to encounter? Uh, the first is manual keying. Um, you know, is what you have today scalable and sustainable? Um, I've had some folks actually tell me that, uh, that they can throw bodies at the issue. And I mean, I suppose that's one solution. But I certainly don't think uh, that it's viable, even in the medium term. Uh, and I suspect that you're here today because you're a little bit more forward thinking than that overall. Um, Second issue is really surrounding security. Um, PCI compliance is just one of the omnipresent threats uh, that seems to lurk over the shoulder of finance teams. Uh, part of the challenge is that very few organizations have a team dedicated to, to security in this aspect. I mean, as a result, the question becomes, you know, who is ultimately responsible? Uh, this inevitably leads to the delightful finger pointing uh, at every other department, uh, and ultimately no one ends up taking that responsibility. Further compounding this issue uh, is knowing and educating the staff, um, you know, what is a violation, and then monitoring every action to endure that compliance. Uh, I actually spoke with one supplier, and he had a major concern uh, because his team would take credit card payments over the phone and then write the numbers on Post-it notes. Um, I talked to another supplier, too, and her team actually had physical printouts of emails containing the credit card numbers out in the open piled on their desk. Um, both of these are very clear PCI violations, um, and I also want to point out that these were organizations that did care about compliance and security, but they still face that, that constant daily challenge. Diving down to the third one, the cash application team is really a, a group that I feel a lot for. Um, they're in a constant state of hurry up. You know, they're constantly trying to, to match payments with a couple of remittance statements. You know, all the while, um, they're usually logging in through multiple systems to do this while trying to, you know, just match invoices back into the ERP. Um, this can be costly in terms of delays, but also costly in terms of human capital um, and errors. Uh, lastly, the fees associated with credit cards are often seen as something of a deal breaker. Um, this is why obtaining that level three uh, really is the, the best and most cost effective way of managing the challenge of credit cards. To put this in context, uh, I just wanted to share a short story about an organization that had these challenges and kind of how they looked to deal with the situation. Uh, Medela, a medical device manufacturer, was one of the first clients to actually utilize our virtual card capture technology. Um, at its core, we were told that they were that they serviced hospi hospitals, excuse me, um, and more and more of these hospitals were pushing to pay by card. Uh, they told us that they had to hire more staff and even temp help. Um, but it was really burdensome uh, and, and was really a challenge for their AR team. They needed to focus on, on credits and collections, and they found that more and more of their time was being spent just keying in information. Um, they kept seeing an ever-increasing volume and, and desperately needed to find an automated solution to manage that. Um, they didn't want to change their customers' behavior. Uh, they more or less wanted to support customers' needs and preferences, but Again, they didn't want to keep throwing people at the problem, especially as it created even more challenges for the team. 
they look to their IT group um, to try and add level three acceptance and other ways to develop in-house solutions. And there just wasn't a good way to build, maintain, and grow the solution overall. Moving forward with virtual card capture allowed them to execute their initiative without uh, impacting their customers' preferences. Uh, and they were able to reroute the, the emailed credit card payments into a virtual card box where the payments were automatically run, um, remittance information was captured, and they earned that level three discount for acceptance. Not only did they save with respect to headcount, but they also saved in terms of credit card fees. Uh, by implementing this approach, Medela has a net savings of over $100,000 a year, um, and that's not inclusive of the savings in terms of headcount. So these items here are the reason that it is so important that you, you know, get in front of this challenge before it materially impacts your business more than it likely already has. Um, these are just some of the trends that we're really beginning to see in the market. Um, and, you know, we've already seen what the aggregate spend is going to be for commercial cards. And again, you know, I really can't emphasize this enough, but an increase of more than 24% of virtual cards that amounts to more than $315 billion in spend is something that just cannot be ignored by a team. Of course, with that said, one's approach still needs to be holistic in view. Um, you know, paper check payments, you know, really in the United States anyway, will still continue to account for probably about 50% of B2B payments. Uh, and ACH is likely also going to increase by 15% if those trend lines hold consistent. Um, and, and I anticipate that they probably will. Um, when looking at it from a macro perspective, um, it's unsurprising that the that world-class organizations look for electronic payment adoption and automation solutions for their AR processes. So overall, what does the future state look like? Um, you know, really automation is key uh, and is a key driving force for you know moving forward as an organization overall. And in one case, you know, I can speak on a familiar level. Um, Visa and Bill Trust are, are a natural fit as partners because cardholders, their issuers, and the merchants are, are seamlessly connected through this alliance. Um, the fact is buyers are increasing their credit card usage, as, as we've already seen. Um, and the subsequent rise of payment forms like virtual cards uh, really leaves the supplier's accounts receivable team struggling with how to accommodate buyer's preferences, you know, while keeping the cost and inefficiencies to a minimum. What we have seen collectively is that the B2B focus has traditionally been on the payable side. Um, but the innovation has prompted B2B payment growth, uh, really just has also created more and more challenges for the receivable side. Um, and that's why the partnership kind of emerged here. Um, we've seen a tremendous effort in the AP space for automation. You know, it, it is rare that I speak with an organization that has not made some effort and inroads towards automation all on that side of the house. Uh, really, unfortunately, though, all this has done is kicked it down the road a bit. Um, the efficiencies gained on the AP side are more or less lost by the manually intensive nature of the a a AR process. Um, especially around virtual cards. In other cases, the technology boom in AP has caused additional stressors um, as more influential customers may require your AR system to actually directly interface with their AP system. Again, the high growth of virtual cards has, has really caused challenges for all these reasons, um, you know, which I've previously discussed. And buyers are knowledgeable and, and know that in certain instances, they actually have the upper hand and leverage to pay how they want um, and, and suppliers must really recognize this fact or risk losing a high value customer. Uh, whether it is a aforementioned technology interface or the use of virtual cards, suppliers have to realize that if they make themselves difficult to do business with, their customers will just more than likely go to another supplier. Um, and this is really a key point here. Do not make it difficult for your clients to give you money. Uh, give them an easy and seamless way to interact with your organization um, and this will help in turn increase your cash flow by reducing your DSO. Related to this and you know, to a point that also shouldn't be ignored, buyers are often incentivized by their banks to utilize their cards. Um, frequently that means a percentage of their purchases backed in their coffers. Um, and that's a deal few organizations will pass up on. And if you don't accommodate their desires, again, it'll just force them to go elsewhere. 
So I understand the, land, the landscape is complex. Um, you know, we saw how complex it is to really manage in our, our story about Medela. Um, and, and throwing bodies at this issue, or frankly any challenge, is a costly endeavor, and it lacks the nuanced scalability and sustainability. Um, while automation and integration are the intelligent way that world-class organizations are moving forward. This brings us to our second challenge, security. Um, I mentioned earlier that a few organizations have dedicated security and privacy teams. Um, many times I see the security and privacy issues more or less delegated to IT teams at the default. Um, outside of banks and other financial institutions though, how many IT teams do you know that are certified in privacy measures that are not directly related to IT infrastructure? Um, how many are knowledgeable on the ins and outs of PCI? Uh, if you're cringing because you realize the answer is no one, then you're definitely not alone. Um, this is one of the worst kept secrets in the IT world and why organizations are looking to outsource these challenges so their IT teams can focus on their core competencies. The last item is more of an opportunity. Um, today the processing of virtual cards is largely manual and time consuming. And the advantage of, of you know, credit card payments is the near real-time influx of cash into your business. Uh, in reality, this process is slowed down because humans can only work so fast and they need to manually apply remittance statements and find invoices and all the other messy processes that are left best to, to automation. Now, without getting too far into detail, uh, I think it, it's beneficial to see what this type of automation for a virtual card capture should look like. Um, with our integration, BuildTrust Virtual Card Capture Solution, which automates the acceptance of virtual credit card payments for merchants, will soon be connected to Visa's straight through process platform, um, affording merchants access to optimal rates, all while making more of BuildTrust network of B2B merchants available for immediate payment. BuildTrust Virtual Card Capture, in combination with Visa's SDP, um, addresses the needs of both buyers and suppliers. Buyers can take advantage of the rebates and incentives associated with purchasing card usage, uh, and suppliers can accommodate customer preferences um, while keeping margins intact and ensuring seamless transfer of remittance data into their ERP systems. And I hear, I mean, really what this last slide here is is more or less just the vision of, you know, the way that the value proposition of, of a card-based commercial, you know, payment solution could look. Um, you know, and I really hope that with this integration innovation, um, you know, we can see that next gen B2B solution coming into the fold. Um, I hope our discussion today has really given you some thoughts and insights on, you know, how you can kind of transform your business as it is today into more of a lean operation by reducing complexity um, and really leveraging innovation overall. Uh, with that, that actually concludes my presentation for today. Um, I know I wanted to kick it back over to, to Ken and Sharon here, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have there in the audience. Okay, Patrick. Um, there was a question posed. Um, what would you say the key takeaway was from your presentation today? Um, overall, I would definitely say the biggest takeaway would be preparation. Um, you know, I, I go out and I speak with a lot of organizations at, at shows, on the web, um, and, and they really seem to be more or less two steps behind in terms of AR and these AR automation tools. Um, like I would mentioned, AP teams are, are very much forward thinking. Um, and like I said, too, if you go to some of these financial shows, you'll see a lot of folks trying to push their, their AP automation solutions, and there really just isn't a lot out there for AR. Um, so definitely making sure that you're ahead of the curve, um, listening to your teams and understanding that, you know, you need to, you know, make your voices heard all the way up to your, you know, potentially CFO level, um, that these are issues that are worth time because they're worth money, um, particularly in terms of reducing your DSO. Um, being able to reduce your DSO could, could save hundreds of thousands, you know, even for some companies I've worked with before, millions of dollars. Um, so if I had to get you know, give one takeaway, I would definitely say credit cards are here and they're here to stay. Um, but like I said, you need to be able to, to look at a holistic approach and really reduce those, those DSOs to, to save your organizations a lot of money. Okay, Patrick. Um, there's another question here. It says, sure. please explain.
explain again. Hold on a minute, let me please okay. explain again. This my computer's acting up, I'm sorry. Um, someone posed a question, what is your phone number? My phone number? Yes, I guess they want to speak to you after the presentation. Sure thing. So it's actually right here on this last slide. Uh, my phone number right here is, is 609-245-0679. Um, and my email is listed right here as well. So Sharon, once you send out the presentation, you all will have my contact information. Um, you know, if you would like any more information about any of this, feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to get it to anyone. Okay. Now I have my question up. It says, please explain again the difference between corporate, business card, and virtual card. Okay. Um, so a corporate card would be something, um, you know, along the lines of your traditional credit card. So, I mean, we all have credit cards in our pockets. Um, you know, a corporate card is just a, a traditional credit card that you would give out to, say, an event manager, um, so they can go out and, and spend for events and, and you know, ship their, their your products to the event locations. Um, that's going to be a card in their name, and you're probably eventually then going to go and follow up with them, um, you know, to get the you know receipt or invoice data for that purchase. Um, with a virtual card, that's actually going to more than, more than likely be tied to your um, organization's account, um, whether it be, like I said, with your AP provider or your bank itself. Um, and that will more or less just get pulled out of that account when it's utilized. Um, so same thing, if you're an AP team making a payment, you would go into your AP portal, request a virtual card for a set amount, um, and the AP portal would generate the, the card number for you to go out and make that payment. Um, from that, the AR team that facilitates the payment would be sending back over the, the data for your AR or your AP team or your bank. Um, you wouldn't be having to kind of go through and, you know, go reach out to your event coordinator or your event manager to get the invoice data to then remit it back into your ERP. Um, it more or less is, is a seamless transaction for your teams. Okay, Patrick, someone just posted a question. Um, what is the benefit of a virtual card? Um, so there, there are multiple benefits, like I said. Um, you know, the aforementioned um, scenario I kind of laid out is a benefit. It kind of, you know, consolidates a lot of those purchases that, that folks are making throughout your organization. Um, I would definitely say, though, security is probably the biggest benefit. Um, you know, I, I can actually tell a story of someone I spoke with at one of the shows I was at recently, um, and they actually had an issue with these virtual cards coming in because, you know, the the buyer was only utilizing these card numbers because they were only for a single use, for a single amount, and like I said, expired at a predetermined date. It's usually about a week after the card number is um, facilitated and given out. Um, and their issue was actually their AR team was having so many of these payments coming in that sometimes they weren't actually getting around to being able to key in the data and losing out on that payment and then having to connect with their buyer and ask for them to, you know, resubmit another number. Um, so it was really just, you know, muddying their entire process overall. But to get back to the question, the reason the AP teams are more than likely to look to use these virtual cards um, is for that security reason. You know, they're going to send you an email with a number. You know, you can't charge that card hundreds of thousands of dollars for something. It, it's, you know, predetermined for $200, so you can only charge it for $200. Um, you know, it, it's protected because you're not calling someone over the phone, like I had mentioned in some of my examples throughout the slideshow, that, you know, you're not calling, giving a credit card number to somebody who might just be jotting it down on a notepad on their desk where it's out in the open. Um, so it really just protects the AP teams and, and protects the payments that they're giving out. Okay, Patrick, do you have time for another question? Sure, I got, um, I got plenty of time. Fire away. Okay. Do companies absorb credit card processing costs by increasing prices? Uh, can you repeat that question one more time? I just want to make sure I got it correctly. Okay. Um, do companies absorb 
credit card processing cost by increasing prices? Um, so the answer there is yes and no. Um, I have seen some organizations that will actually run an upcharge for folks utilizing a credit card um, to cover those processing fees. More than likely, though, most organizations are not. Um, and the reason for that is just because of the, the customer service aspect of a company. Um, you know, you don't want them finding out that you're charging company ABC, you know, $500 for the same thing that you're charging them $600 for because you've got to cover your, your credit card processing fees. Um, so that's why it, it kind of comes back to most organizations are really trying to utilize the solution to help them um, achieve level three processing. So those fees can be greatly reduced. Um, and they can be able to, you know, facilitate folks wanting to pay with cards, keep up that customer service rep that they've, you know, worked so hard to achieve, and still be able to, to recoup as much money as they possibly can. Okay. Um, the next question I have here, um, they're asking, are virtual cards reversible for payments like EFTs? Uh, yes, I believe they are. Um, definitely whoever asked that question on the phone, reach out to me after this. Um, I will get with our one of our product managers to just confirm that, but uh, I do believe that they are reversible, at least right now. Um, and I believe that you're also able to uh, change the predetermined date uh, prior to the card being run. So if you send it out and you give it a date of a week's time, um, and you wanted to change that date to three days' time, I believe you're able to do that if, if the processing of the payment has not occurred yet. Um, I, like I said, I will have to check in on that, though, so feel free to reach out to me, and I can definitely get you, um, you know, the exact information on that. Okay, um, Patrick, another question. Um, the person wrote, we process cards. I am more interested in reducing the manual procedures. How can this be done? Okay, so in terms of processing cards, um, you know, really the best way to go about it, and I mean I'll utilize the example here with our virtual card capture technology, um, you know, you're able to have those, those card payments set in directly to an inbox um, and have those be manually, you know, have them automatically be keyed in for you um, instead of having to, to manually go in and type those numbers. Um, if you're talking about having an actual card um, coming in in terms of a corporate card somebody's using, um, the best way I could say would be utilizing an online payment portal solution. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, folks are actually then going in and keying in the information for you to make a payment. Um, they're not, you know, so much calling you and, and giving you a card number. Um, there are options as well for, you know, IVR in terms of someone calling um, and, and speaking with a bot to then have to put in a credit card number as well. Um, really, you're just trying to take away those manual touch points of, you know, person-to-person -person interaction to kind of cut down on those, those manual keying processes. Um, I would say though with that too, sometimes people just really like to talk to people. Um, so you might get those folks that still try to bypass all that to talk to you and, and ask you to take their card personally. Okay, um, here's a rather large question. <laughs> um, please help us understand better how companies could eliminate the PCI responsibility by passing it on to have the third party handle it. Okay, so um, in terms of having to, to worry about PCI, um, I'll take one of the examples I gave uh, of someone, you know, having a, a printout stack of emails on their, their desk for card numbers. Um, by utilizing someone like Bill Trust, um, when they're sending in those card numbers, they're going directly to us. Um, our technology is pulling out those, those numbers and those charges directly from the email. Um, and pushing that to the invoice that it's set to make payment for. Um, so you're not having a member of your team actually printing out or, or having to type in those figures. Um, same thing going back to phone, I would mentioned, you know, with IVR technology that, that Bill Trust uh, accrues here. 
um, you know, you have that ability to have a, an automated technology, um, have the, the buyer go in and punch in their, their credit card number and it comes directly to us. Um, so we are PCI compliant. We go through the PCI process every year. Um, and you want to be able to ask a, a vendor about that. Ask them if they're PCI compliant. Ask them how often they're tested in terms of their PCI compliance. Um, you know, because it just, the, the less manual touch points you're having your team go through um, on a daily basis in terms of manually keying in data, um, you know, the less you have to worry about that PCI compliance. And by passing over, you know, to a solution such as Bill Trust, who does go through that, um, you know, sometimes ridiculous PCI compliance aspect and testing, um, you know, we take that burden completely away from you. The data is passed through us. We have to worry about protecting it and making sure that it's, you know, processed correctly. Um, and it just takes the, the burden off your team. <clears throat> All right, um, we have one more question here, Patrick. The Got question it. is the increase in virtual card use basically for open account payments, or are they expected to be used for prepayment type situations? Um, so right now it's more for open. Um, we have begun to see some folks looking to to charge for a credit on account, um, which, you know, I'm, uh, personally myself, I'm not really sure why organizations might want to do that, um, but we have seen that that these virtual cards, you know, they operate similar to a credit card. If you want to pay somebody so you can get a credit on account, um, you know, you're more than welcome to do that. You're more than welcome to, to pass that along. Um, those figures are more or less against open invoices. So those are for payments of, of you know, um, open invoice and, and open data. Um, like I said, there there definitely will be some that will probably begin to pay more or less for credit on account, but we haven't really seen a big influx in that as of yet. All right, Patrick, I guess we're going to wrap this up. There are no more questions. Uh, okay. With that, we are going to close today's webinar. I would like to take to thank Patrick Swisher for taking the time to present to our group today and thank all of today's attendees for taking time out of their day to join us. Thank you all again and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.